Okay, great. Hello, everyone, uh, and welcome to today's presentation on using pain pumps in the home. This session is part of the Palliative Care Echo Project's National Webinar Series. It's great to have you all join us today. Next slide, please. Before we get into our presentation, I just want to take a, a brief moment to acknowledge the land on which I am presenting from, which is the city of Ottawa, uh, which is the uns, uh, traditional unceded and unsurrendered territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabeg people. And the Algonquin peoples have lived on this land since time immemorial. And I acknowledge the historical oppression of lands, cultures, and the original peoples in what we now know as Canada and believe wholeheartedly that the work that we do collectively in palliative care can contribute to the healing and decolonizing journey that we all share together. And we are grateful to have the opportunity to be present on this territory today. Next slide, please. Okay, so today's presentation is part of the Palliative Care Echo Project, with, which is a, a national five-year initiative aimed at cultivating communities of practice uh, and supporting continuing professional development among healthcare professionals such as yourself right across the country who care for patients with a life limiting illness. This project uh, will provide a lifelong learning journey for healthcare providers to build uh, local capacity to provide palliative care approach to patients and their families. Uh, the Palliative Care Echo Project is made possible thanks to a financial contribution from Health Canada. Uh, the content and views expressed throughout today's presentation do not necessarily represent the views of Health Canada. And uh, I think it's also important to understand that the Palliative Care Echo Project is, is not a replacement for foundational training on the palliative care approach through programs such as Pallium's uh, LEAP Core course, uh, which you see here on the slide. And if you haven't taken a LEAP course uh, to acquire the, the knowledge, the skills, and the confidence to provide earlier, more effective, and more compassionate palliative care, then I'd really encourage you to uh, visit pallium.ca, take a look at the different courses that we offer. Um, the feedback we got from these courses is always very, very strong and positive. Uh, so we encourage you to take a look at that. Uh, so thank you for that. And let's move on to the next slide. Uh, so for today, I'm gonna to be your host and moderator uh, for the session. My name is Jeffrey Moat. I am the Chief Executive Officer of Pallium Canada. And it gives me great pleasure to introduce Melina Perron, who is a registered nurse uh, and clinical director of home and community care support services in the Central East Lynn here in Ontario. So a very warm welcome to Melina. Uh, and before I hand over uh, the floor to our uh, distinguished guest, uh, just uh, some disclosures to, uh, to uh, share with you. So um, first off, Pallium Canada, we're a national nonprofit organization founded in 2000, uh, based here in Ottawa, uh, funded in part by Health Canada, and we equip healthcare professionals, uh, healthcare organizations, and people in our communities with the skills and the knowledge to provide palliative care earlier, more effectively, and more compassionately to all Canadians. And as I said, the, uh, the Palliative Care Echo Project is funded in part through a contribution agreement from Health Canada. Uh, Pallium also drives funding from the sale of uh, our lead courseware, our Pallium uh, Palliative Pocketbook. Uh, and in terms of conflict, uh, I'm an employee of Pallium Canada and would ask uh, our, our guest, uh, Melina, to uh, share if she has any potential conflicts. Uh, Melina, any conflicts to declare? I don't have any conflicts. I am not being paid for today's presentation. Um, so yeah. Okay, wonderful, thank you. Next slide, please. Okay, so again, wanna welcome you to what uh, I think is gonna be a very interesting and informative session. I'm very much looking forward to learning more about uh, pain pumps. And uh, just in terms of a reminder, your microphones, um, I believe have been muted. Uh, doesn't mean we don't wanna hear from you though. Uh, we would love to hear uh, your thoughts and questions throughout the webinar and uh, you can express yourself through the Q&R function at the bottom of your screen. Um, in doing so, you're going to help to contribute to the knowledge that we generate over the next hour. So thank you in advance for doing so. And just a reminder, please don't disclose any personal health information uh, during the session. Uh, lastly, please complete the survey uh, that we'll be placing in the chat box at the end of the session. Uh, we'll collect and collate all of this uh, data for future reference. Uh, and this session is being recorded and it'll be emailed to all of you uh, shortly after the conclusion of the session. 
And uh, with that, I am going to pass the floor over to Melina. Thank Great. You. So thank you so much for the warm welcome and uh, nice to virtually meet everybody here today. My name is Melina Perron. And as described earlier, I am a registered nurse. Um, I'm located in Ontario and work as a clinical director for home and community care support services here. Um, I'm also the clinical co-lead and director for the Regional Palliative Care Network um, Central East. So today we're just going to talk about uh, pain pumps in the community. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to get started with a poll, make sure everybody is awake. Um, so it, this is a pretty simple question. Have you ever used a pain pump in the community for an end of life patient? Um, so your choices are one or yes, no, or not applicable. I'll just give a few seconds to answer that. All right, so it looks like we have a 50 50 um, mix today. So that's great. Um, for some of you, this will be uh, hopefully some review, and for others, perhaps some new information. So we'll We'll go ahead and get started. So what is pain? Um, so pain is um, an unpleasant emotional and sensory experience. It's whatever the uh, experiencing person says it is. <clears throat> and it exists whenever the, uh, the person says it, it does. Um, it can be psychological, physical, spiritual, or a combination. Um, this doesn't mean that pain is all in the mind, rather that uh, psychological factors can make it much harder to deal with. Sometimes a patient's physical pain may not improve until psychological issues are resolved or addressed. For example, a patient may feel distressed or isolated or anxious, and we need to look at that um, as total pain. Pain is also different for everyone. It's common for people living with life-limiting or threatening illnesses. However, some of those uh, people don't have any pain at all. It can fluctuate and become worse. And not all pain is the same and requires assessment to determine the treatment options. Um, so true or false, the following are all characteristics of pain. Stabbing, cutting, stinging, burning, Boring, splitting, colicky, crushing, gnawing, nagging, gripping, scalding, shooting, or throbbing. It may be dull or sharp, localized or general, persistent, recurrent, chronic, or radiating. True or false? True, perfect. So everybody is paying attention so far. All right, so managing pain. Um, managing pain really begins with a careful assessment. Um, the human experience is a, a, of pain is complex. So it really encompasses uh, physical, social, spiritual, um, and psychological aspects. Um, again, known as total pain. Unrelief pain results in consequences such as decreased sleep, increased tiredness, fatigue, lethargy, as well as memory or functional and appetite impairments, increased irritability, anxiety, depression, and decreased social interactions or activities. So when we're uh, choosing or when we're assessing for pain, we need to choose um, the appropriate tool. Um, so when we're doing that, we're really considering the age of the person, their physical, emotional, and cognitive status and preference. Um, and I've just listed here some common tools that are used to screen and assess pain. So there's the symptom acronym. Uh, so that's the OPQRSTUV, which really stands for onset, provoking or palliating, quality, um, region or radiation, severity, treatment, um, the understanding or the impact on you and the values. It assists um, healthcare providers really in completing a comprehensive symptom assessment when a patient identifies a symptom, occurrence or experience to be distressing. Um, there's also the pre brief pain inventory, uh, the short form. 
And um, it's a nine item self-administered questionnaire used to evaluate the severity of a patient's pain um, and some of the impacts of the patient uh, on the patient uh, in regards to their daily functioning. There's the pain ad, which is a pain assessment in advanced dementia scale. Um, and this evaluates really the degree of pain in patients with dementia based on behaviors um, in five different categories. There's the ESAS, which uh, stands for the Edmonton Symptom Assessment System. And it's really just a, a questionnaire for patients to rate their, the intensity of nine common symptoms, um, which include pain, tiredness, nausea, depression, anxiety, drowsiness, appetite, well-being, and shortness of breath. Really can give clinicians a good indication of, of where the patient thinks um, they're at in, in regards to all their symptoms or most of their symptoms. Um, there's the numeric rating scale, otherwise known as the NRS, and it's really a scale of zero to 10. Um, zero would be no pain, 10 would be the absolute worst pain. Um, and we ask patients to rate uh, their pain on that scale. There's the Abbey pain scale. Um, and really that's just an instrument designed to assist in the assessment of pain in patients who are unable to clearly articulate their needs. So, um, as an example, a patient with dementia, um, somebody who's having communication issues or cognitive um, concerns. Um, there's a spiritual assessment tool, again, going back to that total pain. Um, so sometimes we need to identify what uh, spiritual concerns they may have, um, such as their belief or meaning of life, the importance of spirituality on um, their life and the influence of their uh, belief system or values. And then the general anxiety disorder um, tool as well, which is a self-reported questionnaire for screening um, the severity and measuring uh, generalized anxiety disorder. So screening and assessment tools should be completed according to the patient's accessibility requirements. Um, so for example, the patient may have communication or cognitive impairments and it may, um, or they may have decreased vision or hearing loss. Um, so information should be uh, communicated appropriately. So our next poll is uh, total pain consists of the following factors. One, physical, social, spiritual, or psychological. Two, physical, consolability, crying, and spiritual. Three, spiritual, social, behavioral, or location or four patient needs to experience pain all over their bo body in order to experience total pain. Just give that a few seconds. Excellent. So that's right. Total pain consists of physical, um, which are things like comorbid um, causes, um, could be caused by treat treatments, um, caused by their cancer. For psychological, we're looking at things like anxiety, fear of suffering, past experiences or anticipated pain, um, some depression. For social, uh, we're really looking at um, things such as loss of a job or financial concerns. Um, social status changes, worries about future of the family, and then spiritual. This can be um, fears of the unknown or difficulty finding meaning in their lives, lo loss of faith, faith, sorry, or anger um, with God at times or fate. So great. So what is a pain pump? Um, so once a pain type or types have been identified, prescribers should treat accordingly. Uh, prescribers should start at the appropriate level of pain medications for the patient's pain, um, typically by following the World Health Organization analgesic ladder. Um, straight opioids are easier to titrate and safer than combinations um, that contain medications which have a ceiling doses such as Tylenol or uh, acetaminophen. So the World Health Organization pain ladder was developed in 1986, and it was a conceptual model to guide the management of cancer pain, but it's now been worldwide um, 
or promoted worldwide for use um, for all pain management, um, especially that around serious illness, in, including pain from wounds. Um, so a pain pump is a small computerized device administered through the subcutaneous tissue, which permits patients to receive a continuous infusion of pain medication. It's used as a standard of care for managing uh, moderate to severe pain um, or shortness of breath when the oral or rectal route is unavailable and or frequent uh, dose adjustments are, re are required. It also allows patients and families to administer additional small doses as needed to provide more pain control. Um, the pumps are typically programmed uh, to limit the number of additional doses that the person can receive um, so that they wouldn't exceed um, a safe hourly limit of narcotics or medication. Um, so this mode is, uh, of delivery is typically used for people who have had prior opioid use and are not opioid naive. Um, so there are many types of pain pumps, including uh, large volume, patient-controlled analgesics, elastomeric, syringe, enteral, um, insulin pumps. Some are designed um, mainly for stationary use at the patient's bedside, whereas others um, called ambulatory infusion pumps are design designed to be portable uh, or wearable. So in home care, we mainly use uh, continuous subcutaneous infusions. So see... CSCI, um, and some examples of these pumps are the CAD pump, uh, which stands for Continuous Ambulatory Delivery Device, or a bodyguard, a bodyguard pump. And um, I know this presentation is being done Canada-wide, so I'm not sure uh, what other pumps are outside of this province, but I know in our area, these are our two main pumps. Uh, so these continuous uh, subcutaneous infusion pumps can also be used to administer other medications to support other symptoms such as nausea and vomiting, agitation, seizures, etc. Um, most of them have features such as different lock levels to ensure patient safety uh, and alarms and you typically have filter tubing and um, do require some maintenance so. And there are two ways that the medications can be given through a pump. Uh, one is the pharmacy would get the medications ready in a reservoir cassette, um, or the medication will come in ready in a small IV bag. Some pumps may come with a bolus cord to make it easier for a patient to self-administer break, breakthrough dose, doses. Uh, but typically, if there's no bolus cord um, attached, there is typically a, a bolus button um, on the pump. We've lost our slides. <clears throat> so supplies required with a pump. Um, so typical supplies required uh, usually, of course, is the pain pump, the actual pain pump itself, um, a pump case and a carry bag if the patient's mobile, a bolus cord if it's required, an IV pole, often these ambulatory uh, pumps do have an attachment that can be used um, with an IV pool. Sharps container, uh, pump medication administration record for documenting um, its use. A key for the pump. Oh, there we go. Thank you, Simone. Perfect. Um, so the medication cassette or the IV bag, uh, filtered subcutaneous infusion line, and then a subcutaneous infusion kit. So when is a pain pump used? Uh, so a pain pump is used when patients are unable to take medications orally, typically as a result of maybe persistent nausea or vomiting, uh, dysphagia, so that's difficulty swallowing, severe weakness or lethargy, um, unconscious, poor absorption of oral medications. It can also be used for patients that are unwilling to take medications by mouth, um, have a malignant bowel obstruction, say, where surgical intervention is inappropriate. Sometimes we use them for patients who have um, head or neck lesions, when pill burden is excessive, or um, have unpredictable or escalating pain symptoms or patterns.
So advantages of using a pain pump um, really include ensuring a steady infusion of drugs. So concentrations are maintained without peaks and troughs, giving a constant therapeutic drug level over a 24 hour period. It's a reliable absorption, uh, typically, typically no need for IV access, uh, increased comfort as repeated injections aren't required, control of multiple symptoms with a combination of drugs, uh, and then there's other practical advantages such as easily uh, titrated, uh, facilitates patient control, provides a more reliable uh, record of PRN dosing, may reduce nursing burden and reduce risk of drug diversion. Um, oftentimes if the patient is still mobile, uh, mobility is maintained because the device is lightweight and can be worn uh, in a holster under or over their clothing. Um, so disadvantages of using a pump. Uh, sorry, uh, really a more limited number of opioid options. Um, so we can't give things like oxycodone, um, methadone or codeine, increased costs. Uh, it is more expensive with supplies and pump requirements. Um, some patients may find that it, the pump is uh, burdensome. Uh, it could be cumbersome for patients to carry around. Sub-Q site irritation may, uh, may occur uh, or allergies to adhesives, uh, possible inflammation and pain at the infusion site and potential source of infection, possibility of frequent rotation of sites, um, staff training, uh, health human resource capacity issues have proven to increase this challenge, uh, inconsistent pain assessments. And in cachectic or emaciated patients, uh, for those who are on longer term uh, infusions, uh, skin sites may be, become a problem. Uh, so most typical opioids used uh, with a pain pump include hydromorphone, morphine, and fentanyl. In our community, we mainly use uh, hydromorphone and, and morphine. So the pump provides a continuous infusion programmed at an hourly basal rate. It's important to remember to adjust breakthrough doses in parallel to the basal doses. Um, so this mode of delivery is typically used for patients who have had prior opioid use um, and aren't opioid naive. And it's important to be aware of the peak time for analgesia and drug uh, metabolism. So in general, for opioids administered subcutaneously, the time varies, but is usually between 20 to 30 minutes. So rather than waiting the length of the opioid half-life, uh, clinicians should really feel comfortable administering a repeat dose after the time um, to peak analgesic effect if the patient is still in pain or having breakthrough pain. We also really need to keep in mind that liver and kidneys uh, metabolize different opioids in varying degrees. Um, so really understanding relative contraindications to specific drugs promote safety without compromising um, the medication um, treatment. So prescribing a pain pump. So in addition um, to standard prescribing requirements, such as, um, you know, the prescriber's printed name, signature, electronic signature, and uh, their college um, registration or other requirements, um, which can also include the prescriber's practice address, patient's name, the name of drug, the drug strength and quantity, uh, the directions for use, the full date the prescription was issued, so, uh, and then any refill instructions. Uh, the prescriber must also indicate the drug, uh, the concentration, the rate, so milligrams per hour, the breakthrough dosing, the breakthrough intervals and the cassette volume, if that's applicable, or the um, the IV bag um, volume. So titrating the pain dosing. Sometimes a patient may uh, experience increased uh, pain 
and even though it's already be being managed with opioids. So this happens when the pain becomes stronger uh, than the pain control the patient is on. Um, so patients may experience acute episodes of pain uh, superimposed on their constant or ongoing pain. And this is what we call breakthrough pain. Uh, breakthrough pain can be predictable, um, which is brought on by, by movement or a sneeze or a cough, or it can be spontaneous, so without any precipitating factors. So it can happen from a few to many times per day, it can last seconds to hours. It is normal for patients with relatively good pain control to require two to three breakthroughs per day. Um, however, if a patient requires more than three breakthroughs per day over a period of two to three days, um, the prescriber should really consider titrating the medications. So the amount by which the medication is increased should be proportionate to the dose the patient is already on to avoid over or under dosing. <clears throat> oh, perfect. Um, Susan just commented that they don't want to mess it up, but they also include pump failure orders. Um, so titrating, um, can be done usually by increasing the total regular dose by the amount of breakthrough doses used, uh, by increasing the regular dose by a specified percentage or a combination of those two. So I think we're gonna do another poll. Oh, do we miss a poll? Um, we might be having some technical difficulties, so maybe if you want to read the question, Melina, we get people to type in their answers in the chat function. Oh, okay, great. Um, oh, there we go. Uh, we're lucky it worked. Great. Okay, so this is poll four, which was from previously, but we'll answer this one as well. So continuous subcutaneous infusion pumps can also be used to administer other medications to support other symptoms such as nausea, vomiting, agitation, seizures, et cetera. True or false? Just give that a second. We could still be have. Oh, there we go. So that's true. Um, so continuous uh, subcutaneous infusion pumps, we do mainly see them for pain control. However, we can uh, support other symptoms with those if needed. And then this is our current poll. So breakthrough pain can be predictable or uh, spontaneous, true or false. Perfect, so everybody is paying attention, great. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about uh, administering a pain pump. So pain pumps are typically pre-programmed by the pharmacies to deliver the medications as prescribed over continuous infusion. Um, so an indwelling butterfly or subcutaneous needle is inserted into the subcutaneous tissue typically in the upper arms, thighs, or abdomen, um, there's more uh, subcutaneous tissue. It can be left in place for several days. However, the site needs to be assessed daily for inflammation or infection. Um, medication bags or cassettes are monitored and changed when empty. And if you're administering more than one medication, it can be um, administered several ways when using the subcutaneous route. So for a separate uh, subcutaneous, so first, if a separate, uh, sorry, subcutaneous site is required for each medication, um, 
sometimes if the medications are compatible, you can use one line and uh, administer it together. Or um, yeah, sometimes we just need more sites. Subcutaneous line changes are done when the medication bags are changed. Uh, the pump tubing should be changed every seven days or when the cassette bag is changed or when the system is compromised or as per local policies. I think it varies really across um, organizations. So subcutaneous lines should be clearly labeled per local policies and uh, they really need to include the medication name, the concentration and the date. Patients and caregivers should be educated about uh, certain things to look for, such as skin irritation, redness, discomfort, increasing pain, uh, what to do in the event that the alarm goes off, keeping the area dry, avoid dropping it, and to take extra care when washing or getting dressed that the tube isn't uh, pulled out or kinked. Uh, so some of the just general care of a pain pump. Uh, so nursing visits should be scheduled regularly to review the patient's symptoms and check the, the uh, pain pump. So the nurse would typically check the area around the cannula, um, looking for skin irritation, redness, or discomfort, uh, which all, may all be signs of infection. Um, keep the area around the site clean and dry and check that there's no leakage. Check the line to make sure it's not twisted, trapped, or caught, for example, um, if it's maybe stuck under a uh, part of the body. Check there are no white particles along the tubing. Uh, this can mean that the medication is crystallizing. Place the pump in a safe and comfortable position. So for patients that are bed bound, we typically uh, tuck them slightly under a pillow, which can be a good place or um, at the foot of the bed. If the patient is able to move around, they might find it helpful to have a, a bag or a pump bag to keep it safe and in a comfortable position. These bags can be used over the shoulder or it can be um, tied around the waist. Avoid getting the pump wet. If a patient wants to shower or bathe, uh, they should really speak to their healthcare provider first or their home nurse um, on advice on how to, to manage that. Uh, report immediately if the pet the pump does get wet or is dropped uh, and don't position the pump in sunlight or anywhere it can get too hot. This can affect the medication inside the, um, the bag or cassette. Uh, so troubleshooting the pain pump. So we would always refer to the manufacturing and vendor information. Um, Contact your direct supervisor, manager, or vendor if you're unable to troubleshoot uh, the issue in the home. Common reasons for, for alarms or reasons for having to troubleshoot are, are usually low battery, um, and that's resolved quite quickly by just plugging the device in or air in the line, and that's been reduced uh, significantly with the uh, filtered tubing. So conversations around the pain pump. It's important to discuss why the pain pump is being considered with the patient and those looking after them. Uh, so we wanna listen to their concerns and reassure them that the pump is a safe and effective way to manage their symptoms. The patient should be involved in the decision-making to have a pain pump. Uh, when we're using a pain pump, or you can tell them that using a pain pump won't cause a patient to die sooner, um, but some patients, families, uh, or friends uh, might be worried about that. You can reassure them that the painkillers or the opioids or other medications are safe and effective when prescribed appropriately and administered correctly. And often pain pumps are set up at a time when the patient is rapidly deteriorating and the pain pump is the best option to manage their symptoms. We would establish the goal of symptom management with the patient. Uh, instruct the patient on how to use the, uh, the bolus uh, button or, or cord for when a dose of medication is needed and ensure that the patient understands that the pump has preset limits, which would prevent them from receiving too much medication. In some palliative care cases or end of life cases, the family uh, or the nurse may 
press the button uh, if the patient is unable to do so for themselves. Again, after an appropriate assessment to determine that that patient requires um, additional medications. And instruct the patient to notify the nurse if uh, they're experiencing any side effects, um, which can include itching, rash, nausea, twitching, increased pain, and hallucination. And that's also a part of the nurse's role in the home is to assess for those symptoms. So a multidisciplinary team or approach. Uh, so really this is just simply the group of healthcare professionals of varied disciplines and roles working together um, towards a common goal of providing optimal care for a patient and their caregivers. Um, so everybody's kind of involved when there's pain pumps or any other care needs really. Uh, so care coordinators, which can really support patients and their families in service planning and system navigation. Uh, physiotherapists and occupational therapists can provide non-pharmacological interve interventions for pain management. Uh, we look at radiation oncology or medical oncology. Again, it can assist with pain relief um, treatments. Social workers can help support with uh, social and psychological issues. Uh, chaplaincy um, for spiritual concerns or issues. Personal support workers are obviously uh, frontline and can support uh, with daily care, like massages, monitoring and reporting uh, appropriately. And really there's uh, so many others to support in a multidisciplinary team, uh, pharmacists, <coughs> schools might be involved to support the children of a patient uh, and really just the list goes on. And that um, brings us to questions. And Jeff, I don't know if you uh, can correct me if I'm wrong, but if you have a question, you can unmute or you can put it in the chat. Yeah, that's right. I, at the okay. beginning, I, I said just chat, but you're right, Melina. You okay. can actually uh, unmute and uh, Feel free, anyone, to uh, to unmute yourself and ask a question uh, to Melina of any of the content that uh, that she's just taken us through. And please don't be shy. We're a small group, so it's uh, it'd be lovely to hear from you. Anyone with questions. Charlotte. Hi, hi there. Can you hear me? Yep. Oh, hi. Hi. Thank you. Um, thank you for the presentation. I'm calling from Alberta. Um, and very interesting use of the CAD pumps for pain management. We, in my experience here in home care, um, I personally haven't seen the CAD pumps being used for pain management. I've seen it more for our palliative sedation using midazolam. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm not sure um, if maybe I just haven't come across it yet or if it's something that just consistently here in Alberta we're not doing yet. But I kind of like the idea of the benefits. One benefit I was thinking of would be the caregiver burden piece. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times our fam the families I've had are, you know, giving those sub Q pre-filled um, pain medications every four hours, and then they're giving breakthroughs. So I, I kind of definitely see an opportunity for this to help um, relieve some of that caregiver burden for managing pain. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, great. And um, very interesting to know that you're not using those pumps in Alberta, but Yes, it does uh, relieve a lot of caregiver burden and stress, um, especially, you're right, when we move into that more every two hour, every four hour medication administration, um, it, it can become very um, stressful for, for families to have to set their alarms in the middle of the night and make sure that uh, that medication is being done. So yeah, great. Thank you, Charlotte. 
Thanks for that question, Charlotte. Uh, Melina, I see we have a question from Melissa in the chat function. Yep, so what factors will influence a decision to move from dosing through a sub-Q set uh, to using a pump? So again, um, when we look at when to use a, a pain pump is really when the patient perhaps gets to the point where um, the injections have become burdensome, where we're just continuously uh, re-injecting all the time, uh, they lose their oral or rectal route that we're unable to give medications that way. Um, that's typically the deciding factors. Um, they become uh, more lethargic or even unconscious. Um, sometimes pain needs to be titrated so quickly that it works better on a pump. Um, so we would, there's no single answer uh, for that decision making, but certainly, uh, you know, uh, looking at the bigger picture to determine if it is appropriate and when it is appropriate. Very good. And I see a, <clears throat> looks like a comment from Aaron. Yeah, in our community, typically only the home care nurses can set up and change pump. As an MP who orders a pump for my end of life palliative patients at home, it would be nice if I could change pump when I'm in the home, as home care is not always available. Is there anything to support this? As Bayshore and home and community care do not agree, we should be able to do this. Um, it causes some issues when the patient needs increases and no nurse can go. Um, but I'm there and can't change it. So that's, um, yeah, Erin, that sounds like it might be a, a organizational policy perhaps, um, and, and maybe bringing that back to your leadership to, to have further discussions. But yes, there, there are sometimes those issues uh, organizationally that um, can prevent one person from, from being able to, to change that or provide that direct care. Great, super, thanks Melina. Any other questions or experiences uh, that all of you've had with, um, with pain pumps in, in your respective practices? Would love to hear your experience to see if it's uh, similar to what uh, Melina shared or, or different. I don't see any other comments. Uh, Melina, it was a very thorough presentation and uh, got a couple of thank yous there in the, the chat as well. Um, hang on, I don't wanna miss one here. Yes, thanks, Marie. So um, why don't we flip to the last, the, the last slide? Thank you, uh, Gemma and Holly. So um, first off, a big thank you. Uh, oh, hang on, we do have a question come in. How was the breakthrough dose managed? Uh, with the CAD for clients that cannot swallow pills. Yep, so thank you. Um, so the CAD pump or the continuous subcutaneous um, infusion pump uh, has a, a bolus button on it or a cord that's typically attached and that's how the breakthrough doses is, is are given. Um, so they're given subcutaneously as well as their regular basal rate. Very good. Okay, excellent. Thank you, Adebayo, for that question. Appreciate that. That's good. You got that one in just in the next time. Uh, so uh, just in terms of a wrap up, first off, Melina, thank you. Thank you for taking the time to pull these slides together, uh, for sharing your knowledge through the Palliative Care Echo uh, session today. Very, very informative and appreciate everyone's uh, input and questions that we had as well. Just a reminder, uh, to please fill out the feedback survey. Uh, it's been put into the chat function. It's very brief, it won't take you long, but it does help us evaluate these sessions to improve uh, future ECHO sessions. Uh, and a recording of the session will also be emailed to uh, everyone who uh, registered for this session within the week. So thank you again, uh, Melina, appreciate your time. Uh, anyone's interested in learning more about these types of sessions, visit echopalliative.com. We have all sorts of information on past and future sessions coming up. Again, thanks, Melina. All the best to, uh, to all of you. Have a great rest of your day. Take care.